Okay, chapter 13, monopolistic competition. So, um, this is different than perfect competition, and actually monopolistic competition is pretty common. That's what most businesses really are. So, it's in a way, it's similar, um, but there are some important differences from perfect competition. So, we still have lots of buyers and sellers, so many, many firms in there, um, and very few, if any, barriers to entering or exiting the industry. So, those two things are kind of the same as perfect competition. However, the one that's different here is that um, in perfect competition, we sold um, identical products, but now we sell similar products. So they're similar, but they are um, not exactly the same. So two of the things are the same, but, but this is a very, very important difference in here. So if you can tell the difference, um, either because of brand name or something like that, so restaurants would be a good example of this one. There's a lot of very similar restaurants. Even if you look at like a, if you narrow that down even farther and say like a pizza place, um, there's a bunch of different pizza places. They're all very, very similar, but they are not exactly the same. They have some differences in service or products or, you know, even just the name. And so that would be um, monopolistic competition. So um, barriers to entry are, are low, many firms, and similar but not identical products. So those are the key features in there. Um, the key to success in this firm um, is to be able to differentiate yourself. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is. Um, uh, they give an example in your book, I think, they're working through Chipotle. But, um, but this becomes a very Im important um, part in here because, again, they're similar. And the more you can set yourself apart, the more control you're going to have over what's going on. These guys have a downward-facing demand curve, um, uh, which is what we're used to, right? And so here's the quantity and here's the price. And so in order for them to sell more, they have to drop their price. That's, that's normal. That's pretty much what we're used to but they don't have that horizontal demand curve like perfect competition did. So um, if we look at, uh, and this is a chart that's, that's in your book, if we look at this, the quantity and the price, this is our demand curve, okay? So that's all the way back to chapter three. Um, if the price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. So that's, that's our regular law of demand. That's exactly what we're used to. Now the formulas here are the same, but the results are a little bit different. So total revenue is still price times quantity. If I sell two of them at $9 each, my total revenue is $18, okay? Average revenue is the total revenue divided by the quantity. So I take the total revenue divided by the quantity over here, and that gives me average revenue. Now, in perfect competition, we saw that marginal, average, and the price were all the same, but that's not the case here. So um, now we got an important difference here, but this is this is really what we're going to look at. The formula is the same. It's the change in the total revenue divided by the change in the quantity. The change in the total revenue divided by the change in the quantity. So the formula is the same, but we can see here that they're not quite the same. And we have um, we have two things that kind of result of this, kind of the cause or the result. So we have. Um, the uh, output effect, okay? So we're selling more, so they'll gain revenue because they're selling more products right here. So that's adding to their revenue. But we also have the price effect, which means these guys back here, these first five people would have been willing to pay 750, but they got it for seven. So in order to get this extra quantity right here, I had to drop the price. So I earned seven dollars on these guys. However, I had to drop the price on these guys. So that's the price effect. So what we see is by dropping the price and selling more, I'm adding to my revenue, revenue, but I'm also subtracting from my revenue. So I'm gaining, but I'm also losing by doing this. That's that's kind of what we're what we're talking about here. As a result, and if we can kind of go back to this guy, if I'm going to graph um, the demand curve and also the marginal revenue curve, we're going to see that they're not going to be the same. We can see right here that the marginal revenue for the first one's the same, and then if I'm looking at marginal revenue and price, 
marginal revenue and price. I can see that the marginal revenue is less than the price at each one of these points. The way I calculated is, is the same, but you can see it's getting farther and farther away from, from the price. So if we were to graph both of those, it looks like this. Here's my demand curve, which is the same demand curve we're used to, but here's marginal revenue. So it's below the demand curve, and then it gets farther and farther away. So the farther I go, um, the farther it gets away, because the price effect is becoming bigger than the output effect. So if we go to this one, um, what I'm gaining gets smaller and smaller, and what I'm losing gets bigger and bigger the farther I go um, down that curve. And so that's why your marginal revenue curve will always look down here, um, kind of below that. So um, the other curves, all the cost curves, are going to look exactly the same. It's our demand and our revenue that are, that are different now. And in perfect competition, they were the same. Demand was the price, was the marginal revenue. They were all the same, but now they're not. However, the other thing that is the same is this profit maximization rule right here. So we still find the point where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. That's still going to be our profit maximizing point. Maximizing profit is still our goal. So if we go back to this chart, okay, so here's my demand curve right here. Total revenue is the price times the quantity. Marginal revenue is change in total revenue over the change in the quantity. And then your costs are going to be given to you. Total cost is here. Um, average is total cost divided by quantity. Marginal cost is change in total cost over change in quantity. So those formulas are all the same. And profit is total revenue minus total cost. Okay. So if we look at our keys here are um, marginal cost and marginal revenue. And if we look right here is where they're the same. And that is, in fact, the highest um, revenue point or profit point. Sorry. If you look at these two, if you're if they're both going to give you the same profit, you might as well do the higher one and get um, uh, and get a little bit more market share there. But you can see when I get to the sixth unit, for example, um, my revenue goes up by 450, but my cost goes up by six. So that's why I have a lower I and mean, my my profit starts to go back down. And if I were to keep going, my profit would go down even farther. So I still want to find that magic spot where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Now that's the, that's the first step in the process. So when I was perfect competition, the price was given to me. I didn't have any control over the price. All I did was have to, to pick the quantity that's going to maximize my profits. Now I have, because I'm monopolistic competition, I have two choices to make. So this is how it looks, and these are really the same, it's just this one just has marginal cost and then we've added our other costs on here. But the first thing I always do is find where marginal cost intersects marginal revenue. That's right here at point A. Then I follow that down and that tells me the quantity. Now that I know the quantity, the profit maximizing quantity, I say, all right, if I'm going to make five, what price should I charge? So what you do then is you follow that all the way up until you hit the demand curve, which is right here at point B. And so what they say is, all right, I find where marginal revenue intersects marginal cost. That tells me I'm going to produce five burritos. And then I follow five all the way up until I hit the demand curve, and that says I'm going to charge $7.50. So their profit maximizing point is to make five burritos and charge $7.50 for that. If they do that, we, we just convert that now over here. Um, if they're charging $7.50 and they're making five, at five, their average total cost, so here's their, their cost per unit and their revenue per unit. Revenue per unit, and then this is their cost per unit, because I'm doing average here, this is average. And so I can see the difference here, I've got a dollar fifty per unit is their profit. So $1.50 is their profit per unit and they're making five, so this area right here represents their total profit. So um, the next slide is kind of the same thing, but it has it in, um, in steps for you. So this is the, um, 
again, the revenue per unit and the cost per unit. So price minus average total cost is the profit per unit, okay, times the quantity. Now, this one kind of goes through the steps, which is why I have it in here. The first thing we do is find where marginal cost and marginal revenue intersect. That's right here at point A, okay? Then we draw a vertical line at that quantity. That's this guy right here, okay? Um, that tells us the quantity, okay? Uh, so that tells us that we are going to, the, the quantity is five. Um, so step one is to find where they intersect. That's point A. And then point A tells you the quantity. So the first thing you do is find the quantity. Then you draw the vertical line up and follow that until it hits the demand curve. And we can see with this one, it goes all the way up and it hits the demand curve here at 750. And then, um, uh, that's also where it tells us that at, at that same vertical line here, it hits the average total cost curve at six. So that's your next step right here. It's at six. The difference between these two, 750 minus 650 um, is, uh, oh sorry, that's six dollars, is a dollar fifty is my profit per unit. Profit per unit. Take that times the quantity, so a dollar fifty times five, their total profit is 750. So um, this, is, this is important to kind of follow these steps. And the good news is we've got two more market shares to do after, or market structures to do after this, but the process is exactly the same. So whether it's monopolistic competition or um, uh, oligopolies or monopolies, this, this process is, is exactly the same. Okay. Um, so, uh, what happens to profits in the long run? So we saw in perfect competition that as soon as somebody, um, is making money, it attracts people to the industry, which will drop the price. As soon as people are losing money, people will exit the industry and, uh, um, the, the price will come back up and so it'll settle at that zero economic profit. So we've got a similar thing here, but it is a little bit different. Um, in this example, we saw um, them making a profit, and so we would expect new firms to enter it, and that would reduce the demand for this particular firms, okay? So, um, and we're still going to see that in here. So, this profit's going to attract new firms. We said one of the characteristics of this market structure is there's nothing to prevent people from, from coming in here. And so, new firms will enter the burrito market in this case. And so now people have more choices for their burritos. And so while the market might be selling more burritos, Chipotle individually would be selling less because people have more options now. So this is kind of what that looks like. Um, Chipotle starts out here with this big fat profit, right? They find where marginal cost and marginal revenue intersect. That's right here. They go down. This is the quantity they're going to produce. They follow that all the way up here to the demand curve. And so they're going to charge this price in the short run. And at that quantity, here's their cost. So this whole area is their profit. Now that's a nice big profit, so that attracts more people into the market. So what we see, this is just this isn't the market demand, this is just Chipotle's demand. So for one thing, their demand decreases, but the other thing is it becomes more elastic. See how it's as we go from this one to this one. So not only is it decreasing, but it's also getting flatter. It's getting more elastic because people have more options. And so what that means then, in the long run, we're back to this break even part, okay? And so now they would find where, and so that because then their marginal revenue um, goes down as well because the new marginal revenue will be down here. So they'll find marginal cost. Here's their new marginal revenue in the long run. So they'll produce this many, and you follow that up to the demand curve, here's their price, and that's right there at their average total cost. So they're breaking even in the long run, There's and now we have um, uh, less, no incentive for, for new firms to enter the market. So we saw something similar to that, or we really saw the same thing in perfect competition, 
but it is a little bit different. So um, this one shows you a firm making a profit, okay? And so what they what they've done here, this is really the same thing. They're just kind of building the graph. So we start with just demand and marginal cost, then we average it, add in total cost, and then they're just showing you the profit. That will attract firms into the market. And so then what we see is um, uh, this would be a firm making a loss, okay? And so they would still act, they would still operate where marginal cost and marginal revenue intersect right here. But at this point, uh, their cost is above that price, so these guys have a loss. And then that would, you know, it, it firms would eventually leave the market if they can't make a, a profit. And so in the long run, we settle back here at this at this break-even point, okay? Um, and again, that's economic break-even. They're still making an accounting profit, but economically, they're just kind of breaking even, which means it's, you know, there's there's no reason to leave the they couldn't do they couldn't make more money doing something else. So this is where they'll settle in. Now, in um, uh, what can they do? So so in perfect competition, there's really not much they can do. There, it's the product is undifferentiated. But in um, in monopolistic competition, this economic break even is bound to happen eventually. However they can slow it down, okay? So they can um, have some control over this so that uh, um, they can create a preference for their product, all right? So in the long run, they're moving towards that, that economic break-even point, but that's where they'll go if they don't do anything, okay? But in this option, because they are differentiated products, they can slow that down and they can they can kind of fight that that break even which means they can make a profit um, if they continue to differentiate themselves so it's about the demand curve but it's also about the elasticity that we talked about in chapter five or six or whatever it was so um, uh, so we'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a second here but the other thing we want to talk about was efficiency now we said that perfect competition was maximum efficiency okay but in monopolistic competition it's less efficient for both both economically and um, or I'm sorry both productively and allocatively they're not producing at the if we go back to one of these guys um, they're not producing at so so let's let's look at uh, this guy here they settle in at the long run well let's go back to one making a profit here um, this is not necessarily the lowest point on their average total cost curve so it's not productively efficient because they're not producing at the lowest possible cost and they're also um, they're not selling at the lowest possible price and they're not producing as much as they possibly could either so what we see here, so so a productively efficient um, company would be up here. It would be a lower cost. It would be a higher quantity, and so um, that would maximize efficiency. But these guys are producing less than they're capable of, charging a higher price than they're capable of, not producing at the lowest cost. So that's what we mean when we say that it's not productively efficient and it's not um, allocatively efficient. Is that bad? Um, the lack of efficiency says, hey, this is bad for consumers. You're not getting as much as you can, and you're paying more for it, so so that's bad, right? But not really, because the reason these, these firms are so um, prevalent, that there are so many of these, is because people are willing to pay a higher price for a differentiated product. Um, if people, if, if the difference was not something that mattered to people, they would not be willing to pay more for it. And we talked about this in a couple different things. For example, why is somebody willing to pay more for a Starbucks coffee? The difference that Starbucks created has creates value for some people that they are willing to pay more for it. If it's something that people really didn't care about the difference, then they wouldn't pay more and it settles into perfect competition. But if a firm can convince people that they create a difference that has some value, then people would be willing to pay more and they can stave off that 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 break even that economic um, long run break even. 
So if we look at, if we said, oh, well, perfect competition is, is more um, uh, efficient, we should do that, that means we would all be wearing the exact same clothes, like we would all be walking around in gray jumpsuits that were exactly the same size, we would all be wearing the same shoes, we would all be driving the exact same cars, and um, and people don't want that, so people are willing to pay for differences, and that's why we we have monopolistic competition. So, how does a firm differentiate themselves? This is um, primarily done through through marketing, and I I said earlier that effective marketing isn't convincing people that they want something; it's figuring out what people want and providing it. And so, um, a lot of marketing is is advertising, and that that's not all of it, but um, but that is a big part, and so that's to um, tell people what's different about your product and why it is of value to them. Now, you can't make people value something if they don't value it, but um, uh, but marketing is necessary to to differentiate your product. The more successful you can do it, the longer you can maintain that profit. Um, brand management has to do with maintaining that product differentiation over time, convincing people that um, what you have is different, is of value to them, um, and letting them know kind of why um, why yours is different. But but that's why you don't see perfect comp people in perfect competition advertising, but it's very, very important for a firm um, in monopolistic competition. That is how you maintain, that is how you increase the demand for your product, and that's also how you make it more elastic so that you can maintain that that profit. And the more elastic it is, um, oh, let me go back to, to one of these, sorry. Um, let's go back to this profit. So, so step three um, in this product, you know, you, you figure out the quantity and then you go up to the demand curve. So the steeper this demand curve is, okay, uh, the steeper this demand curve is, when you go to this step to go up to pick the price, the higher you go. And so that's more profit for you. So the more inelastic the demand for your product is, the higher your profit. So that you want you want to not just increase the demand curve, but you want to make it steeper. You want to make it more inelastic as well to maximize your profit. And that is done. A lot of that is done through marketing. So that's why that's a really important for um, strategy for firms in perfect competition. The last section in here, um, they they kind of go into. Um, Porter's five forces um, thing and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so there are some things that are within the control of a firm and there are some things that are not, okay? So what a firm can control, they can differentiate their product. That's how they can increase their revenue and they can lower their cost. And hopefully they're doing both of these at the same time. Those are things that they that they can control, and it has to create value. So if you lower the cost, but you take away value, then you're going to lose revenue as well. So you have to you have to try to re reduce costs in a way that does not affect the value that the customers are receiving. Um, and you can only charge more if you are providing value. So so this is the main thing that is within the control of the company. There are things related to the market that are not um, under a firm's control. Like, it, I mean, right now is the perfect time to see that. If we look at this, a restaurant could have been doing everything they were supposed to be doing, and then a pandemic hits and they have to close, or they can only do takeout. That is, that that's a chance event. That is uh, um, not something that is within their control, and um, and so that's those are those are tough. So so. This, how, what makes a firm successful? Some of it is making the right decisions as far as creating value, the revenue, and the cost. And some of it is, is chance. Some of it is just um, what's happening in the market that you work in, what's happening um, in, in, in the economy, in the society. So some of these things are not in their control. So all they can really do is, factor, uh, is, is focus on the things that they can control. And those are ultimately what leads to um, to profitability in the long run. But um, but everything they do as far as differentiation and the cost all has to get back to also what what customers value. So that's um, the that's has to be um, the the primary focus of of, of all of their strategies there. Uh, so um, 
that's pretty much it for chapter 13. I'll go ahead and post this up there and let me know if you have any questions.